Hello, and welcome to the Kunstler Cast. Thanks for listening in. My guest today is Alice J. Friedman. She's the author of When Trucks Stop Running, Energy and the Future of Transportation, published by Springer Books. She's also the creator of the Energy Skeptic website. That's energyskepticoneword.com. Very worthwhile checking in there. A lot of interesting stuff there. Ms. Friedman is perhaps best known for her book Peak Soil from 2007, which was edited by David Pimentel from Cornell University uh, with Tad Padsick uh, from UC Berkeley and Walter Youngquist, the author of Geodestinies. She lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's a pleasure to have her on the Kunstler Cast. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can become a patron of this show by making a small monthly contribution through my Patreon page. To do that, you can either search for me on patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, or use the link in the upper right-hand corner of my website, kunstler.com. So I'm speaking to Alice Friedman in uh, Oakland, California, and we're going to be talking about uh, oil and trucking and transportation generally and the, the fate of Western civilization or perhaps all of the developed world. And Alice, um, I'm wondering if, uh, if what your view is of the disarray in the global economy right now. We're, we're talking about three or four days after the Brexit vote. And uh, markets are wobbling. There's a lot of political instability out there, especially in Great Britain. Um, but I, I wonder how much you you view all of these problems a, as an expression of more of our deep problem with resources, and especially with energy resources. Oh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, oil peaked, conventional oil, which is where 90% comes from, peaked in 2005. And we have reached the end of growth, and the financial system was never built to handle that. It's built on endless growth and more credit and debt repaid. And I I think it's almost entirely due to energy, which is the true driver of our economy. Um, It seems to me to be very peculiar that uh, the, the, the leaders of the great nations of the world, who, who are not necessarily stupid people, don't understand what an, an anomalous period of history the last 200-odd years have been, uh, you know, the, these years of the techno-industrial society. Do you find that curious? I do, but um, it's interesting. I'm uh, such a geek. I actually enjoy reading the uh, House and Senate congressional record and especially the people that are in the military uh, who testify um, are super aware of this issue. Mm-hmm. And um, Michael Breen of the Truman National Security Project uh, in 2012 um, pretty much said why we're doomed to continue fighting wars in the Middle East. Um, it, we're so dependent on oil as our only transportation fuel um, and our military cannot operate with oil. And that lack of alternatives means that oil is not just a commodity. It is a vital strategic commodity, a substance without our, uh, which our prosperity cannot be sustained. We have no choice but to do whatever it takes in order to obtain a sufficient supply of oil. We share that sad and dangerous predicament with virtually every other nation on earth. Mm-hmm. So to me, that that signals we're never going to get out of the Middle East. We can't. Our uh, civilization would die. And it's it would imply to me that we're never going to be able to face politically the consequences of a no-growth society. It looks that way. Um, President Carter was once invited to speak about uh, in 2009 about how he handled the energy crisis. And he said the number one thing that has to happen is for the president to have fireside chats like I did and educate the people. Mm-hmm. But well, I've seen, you know, they won't get reelected if they do that. They weren't, they're not going to do that. Well, that seems to have been the lesson uh, for Carter, although I'm not sure that, uh, you know, we're drawing the right conclusion 
from that. I'm, he was one guy, and that was one time, and he was a certain personality. Um, I, I do tend to think that the leadership is probably going to have to, you know, surrender to some kind of a some kind of a revolutionary uh, uh, movement of some kind. Uh, and by that, I don't necessarily mean a, you know, a, a bloody uh, upheaval. But some kind of major change in in the personnel, I guess um, you might call that the circulation of elites, you know where one set of elites just gets shoved out and a new set of elites gets installed who have a different worldview yeah i don't see i I always wonder when the crunch hits how they're going to handle it. I'm not quite sure myself well in, in any case, you're the author of uh, the new book. Uh, which is titled "When the Trucks Stop Running," and uh, the trucks really make the world go around, don't they? Especially the USA. And we have more roads than uh, railroad tracks, or rivers, or seacoast, or canals, or any other way of moving things around. We've kind of gotten in the habit of depending on these things, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a real important point to make because um, you know ships. Uh, can be 600 times more energy efficient than um, airplanes and, um, you know, considerably more than um, trucks or rail, but we only have 25,000 miles of waterways. And rail is four times more efficient than trucks, but we only have 95,000 miles of railroad tracks. But we've got four million miles of roads. And yeah. I'm not, you know, and when you think about trucks, it's not just 18-wheelers and delivery vans. You've got um, tractors, harvesters, cranes, garbage, bulldozer, concrete construction, logging, mining, dump, chemical tank trucks. They, they are the true uh, maintainers of civilization as we know it. Mm -hmm. Well, when the trucks stop, uh, uh, America stops. Uh, how does that work? Well, there have actually been um, little experiments, like when the British lorry strikers um, uh, didn't uh, run for a week, and uh, Sweden and America have also done studies on what would happen. Um, the list is too long uh, to, to go into, but, but just here's a, a quick overview. Um, at the end of day one, grocery stores would be out of eggs, milk, bread, and many other products because they get many deliveries a day, um, and so do hospitals, pharmacies, factories, and other businesses. Uh, by the end of day two, panic and hoarding would have emptied most grocery store shelves. Yikes. Restaurants and pharmacies would close. Uh, ATMs would be out of cash. Construction would stop. By the end of day three, sewage treatment, sludge, and slime tanks would be full. By the end of day four, most service stations would be closed uh, because they get deliveries t two or three times a week. Um, and the 685,000 tons of trash we throw out every day would really begin to pile up. Um, by day five, livestock would be getting um, hungry from lack of feed deliveries. By two weeks, no clean water would exist because the chemicals to purify it couldn't be delivered, and everyone would need to boil their water. Uh, within four weeks, hospitals would be out of most things. And with one to two months, the coal stockpiles at power plants would run out due to lack of um, coal deliveries. And you'd start to have blackouts across the most coal-dependent regions. And since electricity is used to pump natural gas through pipelines in many areas, you'd start to have blackouts from natural gas pipelines uh, being unable to deliver electricity to power plants. Hmm. Uh, That's just somewhere in there, the, uh, the nuclear plants uh, go south. Um, yeah, that's a pretty serious thing to happen. The latest... National Research Council report on Fukushima found that if the electricity had been out much longer, uh, the uh, spent nuclear fuel pool at Fukushima, which isn't uh, in the containment area, could have made Tokyo evacuated. Oh, my gosh. And that can certainly happen in the U.S., where we don't have nuclear waste storage. And um, the potential for uh, in just one... Uh, nuclear facility, Peach Bottom, an MIT, MIT study found 18 million people might need to be evacuated. Um, what region is that? Um, Pennsylvania. Oh, my gosh. Near Philadelphia. 
Well, we've really uh, ramped up a, an incredibly complex system, and we've never yeah. really experienced a, a, a major disruption of it. Um, you know, going back to the OPEC oil embargo of 73 and 74, that, that was a kind of a partial interruption, but not complete. Um, do you remember that at all? Yeah, I was in college back then, uh -huh. and um, I had joined an alternate technology group. I was really interested in this. I watched the engineers um, build electric cars, methane cars, windmills, and I got to, to help in the endeavor by drinking a lot of beer and painting the cans black to make a primitive solar collector. <laughs> so I thought the world's problems would be solved uh, e easily, and it would be a big party. Huh. Well, we're going to talk about alternative energy later on, um, but I want to get a few other things out of the way. A lot of people think that the peak oil problem just magically went away, right? It, it's been kind of an era of wishful thinking uh, since the big scares of 2008, you know, when the oil went up to $140 a barrel and the global markets crashed. And and then we got the so-called fracking miracle. We were going to turn into Saudi America. Uh, where are we at with peak oil? Well, the conventional oil, as I mentioned earlier, uh, peaked 10 years ago, and we've been on a plateau since then. The problem is we get well over half of it from only 500 giant oil fields, and uh, over half of them are declining at 6% a year, which will keep accelerating. Um, so by 2030, a huge amount of our oil, both these giant fields and other, will be declining at 9% a year. We could only have half as much oil only 14 years from now because of that. Um, mm -hmm. And it will be very hard to uh, replace with tar sands, fracked, um, or Arctic oil. What is the um, nature of, the, of this uh, non-conventional oil, and, and what makes it um, not a magical answer to our problem? Well, the problem is the rate of the flow. It's as if you, if you squeeze Niagara Falls into just a trickle. You know, yes, there's still a lot of water, but it doesn't come out as fast as you'd like. And so you just cannot get tar sands out, and you have to use so much energy to get them, and fracked oil for that matter, and Arctic oil we don't even know how to get. Um, so, and, and deep sea oil, all of that takes such amount of energy that you have less to return to society. Conventional oil, you used to stick the drill in, and it gushed out like spindle top. And, and um, we, you know, that oil, easy oil, uh, we don't have much left of. So even if oil lasts another several thousand years, it will just be, you know, a, a drip out of the tap at night that keeps you awake instead of the roar of Niagara Falls that we have now. Well, of course, what's faking people out is the fact that the, the market price of oil got so low. It fell to, to so low, you know, to something like $26 a barrel. Um, in the last six months. Uh, it's, re it's gone a little bit higher since then, but now it's actually, it seems to be falling once again. And uh, that has faked them out. And they, I don't know if the public understands that the market price of the oil might be $26, but it still costs, you know, $75 a barrel to get it out of the ground. So that's really not penciling out very well, is it? No, and in fact, you know, it was, we had 30 years of no cafe standards, um, and we finally got them again. But every time the price gas goes down, Americans go back to buying gas guzzlers again. Tell, tell the listeners what CAFE standards are exactly. Well, when Jimmy Carter um, came into office, cars were only getting 12 miles a gallon on average. And he managed to increase that to 27 uh, miles per gallon by the end of his term. But then Reagan dropped them. And the Democrats have never been able to um, get them back until Obama did. And so, the, you know, the goal was to increase miles per gallon to 54. Um, but as soon as gas prices dropped, the uh, incremental achievement we'd made from 22 miles a gallon uh, to, to 25 has gone back down again. And just today in the New York Times, um, it said that people are trading in their electric vehicle, vehicles for gas-guzzling cars. Huh. Are they dissatisfied and, with them, or what? Well, gas is so cheap. Um, it's so convenient. 
Um, and, you know, it, it, they, they perceive it as saving money because they don't have long-term memories or um, a, a true understanding of how finite oil is, apparently. Mm -hmm. I've got some ideas about why the price of oil went down so low, and, and so do a lot of the other people I speak with here. But um, what's your idea of why the price of oil has gone down so low, even though it costs so much to get it out of the ground? Well, you've had a forced reduction in demand for one thing. I know people who haven't recovered from the financial crash. Time magazine had an article recently saying that two-thirds of Americans would have a hard time getting their hands on $1,000. Those people certainly aren't going to be buying electric cars. Uh, or, or better mileage gas cars. Um, I, I, it, I just don't think people can afford oil at a higher price. Well, we, we do know that the middle class is getting crushed, and that might have a great deal to do with the demand destruction. But um, it's also coming from the, uh, you know, the industrial economy, too, is it not? Oh, yeah. And Charles Hall has written about how we're doomed to an eternal cycle of prices for oil ratcheting up, which brings on a uh, recession or depression, which drops them again. And then when you get a recovery and the prices go up, you're knocked down again. Yeah, I think it can be boiled down to a pretty simple equation for the moment that uh, oil over $75 a barrel crushes economies and oil under $75 a barrel crushes oil companies. Yeah, and um, people who have been... Um, working in peak oil economic theory has predicted for decades that what you a sign of it would be these spikes of um, high prices, low prices, high prices, low prices, and it looks like uh, their predictions are coming true. So it's kind of an, an oscillation like, like what, what you would see in uh, like riding a motorcycle in a speed wobble. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, so. it's a dynamic that is a self-reinforcing dynamic. Yep. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about diesel. Um, diesel is what most of the um, industrial trucking machines run on, whether they're harvesters, uh, semi-trailers, uh, uh, cherry pickers, what have you. What's so special about diesel? Well, I, Vaclav Smil would say it was the diesel engine because he doesn't believe we could have possibly achieved as high a le level of civilization as we have without them, and that they're vastly underappreciated. And he has a book on them, which is uh, interesting to read, to see how amazingly, exquisitely crafted they are, how powerful, how well-built. They can last 40 years, go a million miles, uh, double the efficiency of a gasoline engine. Why are they so uh, durable, by the way? They're, they have to be built extremely well to tolerate the powerful... Uh, forces of the of the engine itself, mm -hmm. so you you have to craft it um, to to deal with getting double the power out of it, um, mm -hmm. and and so um, they're just. But the problem with them is they don't burn anything else. That's why you don't hear about diesel haul. They can't even burn gasoline. In fact, they have to burn number two diesel, which has extremely uh, specific. Uh, recipes for how much viscosity, lubricity, water content, flash point, and so on, um, which makes it hard to, you know, more energy to replace it to try to meet those specifications. Mm -hmm. And biodiesel in particular has a hard time um, meeting all of those uh, different essential uh, qualities so that you don't shorten the engine life. And that's why most engine warranties don't allow any biodiesel or at most 5 to 20 percent, uh, or you invalidate your warranty on your engine. And truckers don't want biodiesel because um, they don't go as far. It has, it's 10 percent less energy, and it costs more. Well, we heard a lot about biodiesel in, in around the 2005-2008 you know, period. You know, there, was a, there were all these stories in the press about uh, you know, guys running their cars on used French fried potato oil. Um, so uh, you don't you don't think that that's uh, going to pan out for for trucking anyway? No, I mean the problem with um, biofuels is they simply don't scale up. You'd have to plant half of the lower forty eight states uh, with soybeans 
and uh, whatnot to replace diesel fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, in general, like um, Europe consumes, you know, ma- massive amounts of energy, um, you know, hundreds of times um, more, um, the, the equivalent of hundreds of times more biomass than you could get out of, than, than um, less than the, the fuel we're burning. I'm not I mean, sure I understand that. Uh, uh, let me give a better example. Mm-hmm. Um, it, oil is a biofuel, um, but it took millions of years to brew, and there were 196,000 pounds of fossil plants per gallon of oil. So we're trying to put 40 acres of wheat in our gas tanks every 20 miles. Um, oh. we're, and, and the energy to try to um, do that uh, quickly uh, is usually more energy than you get out of the fuel, uh, or or damn close. I don't want to get into a fight over energy return on energy invested, but biofuels have a very low and probably negative return on energy. Um, and the other thing to consider is, in the future, biofuels will be the only replacements for fossil fuels. Uh-huh. So um, right now, two-thirds of our electricity is generated with coal and natural gas. That'll have to be biomass in the future. Uh, the fertilizer But it's not going to be. I mean, in, in oh. theory, it would have to be if we were going to run our civilization the way we've been running it, but we're not going to do that. Oh, I know, but I think, I think that the scale uh, is the easiest argument for people to understand why it's not going to mm-hmm. fuel transportation because it has so many other essential uses, you know, not just electricity, but uh, 4 billion people are kept alive by natural gas-based fertilizers. Half a million products are made out of fossil fuels as well as the power to make them. Um, You need fossil fuel power to get high enough heat to make cement, steel, ceramics, glass, and so on, provide heat, air conditioning, and cooking. Uh, You know, biomass can't possibly power our vehicles and do all the rest of those things. Mm -hmm. It just simply doesn't scale up. Well, there, we all we have other fantasies about other fuels, um, natural gas, for example. Um, we do know that uh, some trucks have been converted to natural gas. Tell listeners why we're not going to run the existing trucking fleet on natural gas. Well, I mean, na- our our conventional natural gas peaked in 1973, and by 2004, there was such alarm about future supplies that dozens of liquefied Natural gas plants were being planned for to import natural gas. Um, this frack natural gas uh, gave us an extra five or ten years, but uh, if the um, economic frack bubble hadn't burst, it would be geologically bursting between now and 2020. So that's not going to guarantee our future. Um, and it's also, since diesel engines can't burn natural gas, um, it would just be uh, really crazy hard to um, build uh, enough massive heavy tanks, brand new engines, to retrofit our existing trucks and build new ones. Um, we don't have the infrastructure to distribute it. Uh, truckers don't like it because they can only go a quarter to half as far depending on um, which kind of gas they're using, compressed or liquefied. You so, mean between fill-ups? Yeah, between fill-ups. It's... Um, but there's no there's no infrastructure to do it. Yeah, there's no there's uh, no there's no natural gas fill up stations. Yeah, there's 73 liquefied natural gas stations right now, and they're almost all in California. Right. So there's no national network of them, and you couldn't take a truck full of lettuce from uh, Fresno to Philadelphia in a gas in a natural gas truck. No, you couldn't. I mean, there are tanks for private fleets, but they tend to be delivery vans. Yeah. Um, and and private. So at this, there, there actually was hope we'd have twenty percent of our fleet on natural gas by now, but it's only three and a half percent. So that hasn't panned out. Uh, that th- hasn't panned out. There's another kind of wishful thought that we could uh, do the coal to liquids thing, where you basically distill liquid fuels out of uh, coal. Yeah. That, now that is one of the few ways that you could make. A uh, drop-in fuel, a, a diesel that is ex- exactly what trucks burn now. Um, Sasol in South Africa has been doing that for 50 years. Um, but but again, coal does not scale up. I mean, that will shock people. Mm-hmm. Um, we're we're probably 
we're past peak coal in America. We're probably past it globally or close to it. Um, again, look at the scale. If all coal production were converted to liquefied coal, you'd only get a fifth of what you need, and you'd have to shut down all your electric power plants and so on. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't seem like a very good prospect. It, yeah, it's because you'd have to use half the energy in the coal to make the liquefied coal. And if you try to sequester the carbon, another 40%. Mm-hmm. And it also, coal, product, uh, coal to liquids requires a lot of water. And yet most of the uh, reserves in America are in the dry states of Wyoming and Montana. Mm-hmm. So there's other limits. There's, there's limits to water, especially. One of the another fantasy out there was that we were going to convert the entire vehicle fleet to electric, and um, uh, I want to talk about cars for a second uh, rather than trucks. Uh, it seems to me that the the what I call the happy motoring paradigm is uh, failing on the basis of something other than fuel right now and and in a kind of way that wasn't quite expected. And by that I mean um, the financial part of the equation is falling apart because Americans are used to buying their cars on installment loans and that middle class that used to do that is shrinking and getting crushed financially. You know, as you said uh, a few minutes ago, uh, there are very few households in this country that even have a, a thousand extra dollars in the bank to fix a car, let alone make a down payment on one. Um, I also think that because of the, the we're, we've entered a kind of a no growth contracting economy, that that pretty much tells you that we're going to be living in, in an era of capital uh, forma- capital formation impairment, and that there will be less money available to fewer qualified buyers for car loans. So I, I don't, I see the, the motoring system co- just really crapping out on the basis of the finance before we even get to the fuel situation. That could be true, but uh, if, you, if you look at Cuba, you could keep the old vehicles going for quite some time, as long as they have fuel, that is. Well, yeah, as long as they have fuel. And I think what people forget about Cuba is that, um, you know, people point to Cuba as being this example of a country that got over um, its subsidies from Russia or the Soviet Union and and managed to kind of downscale into a a, uh, more utopian, green, uh, eco-nirvana. But what they forget is a couple of things. One is, during this whole period, Cuba was getting remittances in large amounts of money from people outside Cuba who, you know, for one reason or another had left, especially all those people in Florida. Um, So they were getting money from outside the system. Um, But um, they uh, they were also doing that against the background of a world that was still largely intact with all of its, you know, uh, uh, techno industrial equipment running and, and its financial system running. You know, uh, I'm not sure th- that uh, we get to a place where if the financial system is not running, then any that anything runs. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what what's really uh, makes our s- system so vulnerable is everything's interdependent with each other. You know, it's not just energy and electricity that are intertwined. Uh, so that if the electric grid goes down, you can't pump fuel because it's electric. Mm-hmm. But the financial system as well, um, you know, is, is intertwined with all in, in that and uh, makes us very vulnerable. And, and these failures of one part of a system tend to ramify and amplify the failures in other parts of the system, do they not? Oh, absolutely. So let's talk about the electric. Um, what's your view of, of whether we're going to... Uh, electrify the vehicle system in, in the USA? Okay, well, um, I think, you know, a lot of hope rests on batteries. Uh, but we've been hoping uh, since, for, since 215 years ago for battery breakthroughs. And they're only about six times uh, more powerful now than they were centuries ago. Um, even in 1901, uh, the, uh, um, they were hoping for a breakthrough so that cars could run on batteries. Um, 
But the problem is you have to, um, you ha- they can never even come close to oil in power density. Um, and there's too many damn things that are required. Uh, and when you tweak one, you might break another, and it could take you years to find out. Um, for instance, um, they have to be small and lightweight because the heavier a battery is, the less far the vehicle can go. Um, you have to be able to recharge it thousands of times. Uh, for trucks, it would need to last for 15 years. Um, you have to charge them fast. Right now, truck batteries are so large, it takes over 12 hours. Um, you, you can't harm them by over or under charging or discharging. Uh, it has to be able to tolerate heat, cold, shaking, rattling, not explode, um, dozens of parameters. And that's why it takes so long to make any progress. It can take 10 years to improve a battery because you have to retest it. Um, and Tesla doesn't have a better battery. They invented a better battery management system to um, monitor the um, batteries and keep them from getting too hot or cold. But they suck up half the energy doing that. So every time you do make an improvement, a lot of the, the battery management system sucks it up and it makes the car super heavy as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, right now there's no way uh, it, that you could um, get trucks to run on batteries. Um, they're just simply too heavy. Like a truck that could go um, 620 miles uh, with all of the uh, cargo loaded would need a battery weighing 55,000 uh, pounds. I mean, battery's not the truck's not going anywhere with a battery that heavy. So the battery, Another, would, the battery would be the whole load of the truck. Yeah, the battery would be the load. Um, and then that there's, I have in my book several um, instances of that uh, showing that, you know, no, that's not going to happen. So the amazing also, thing it, about diesel is that you get this very concentrated uh, amount of um, propulsion from a relatively small weight of stuff, and it allows you to carry huge amounts of cargo uh, on this vehicle. Yeah, I mean, batteries can be hundreds to thousands of time, times less powerful um, pound for pound. I mean, the energy density of diesel is amazing, and, and it, it's one of the reasons people don't understand why it's so hard to replace. It's mm-hmm. just crazy energy dense. Um, also, battery electric, all, all battery electric trucks are uh, three times more than a, a diesel equivalent. And so, um, you know, a, an all-electric truck might cost $300,000, but you could buy a used one for $3,000, so it's really 100 times more expensive. Well, um, we're agonizing over the system that we use to run trucks, but uh, let's talk about the railroads for a minute. Um, you know, one of the things that puzzles me over the years is that we, we have done absolutely nothing to, to fix the railroad system in the USA, uh, but especially the passenger system. And you know, we, have, we have all this infrastructure lying out there rusting in the rain, and there's no political will or, or no uh, clamor from the public itself, from the voters, to do anything about it. Well, um, I'm mostly concerned with freight rail because Mm -hmm. technically people don't have to travel if things got rough, but the freight trains need to keep moving. Um, And it would make no sense to... to, We have the best freight trains in the world, um, but they're privately owned. They're the only form of transport that gets no uh, public funding. Um, Mm -hmm. Trucks are subsidized by... um, you know, our taxes we pay when we buy gasoline. Mm-hmm. And the damage they do to the roads isn't nearly compensated for in the fees they pay. Mm-hmm. So it's very hard to improve um, freight rail because they plow back um, a huge percent of their earnings back into maintaining what they have. Um, and it would make no sense to electrify them um, because uh, diesel electric locomotives are already electric. They simply have the power station on board instead of in some distant place with hundreds of miles of electric lines running to the rail tracks. Um, And their engines can be more efficient than a power plant as well. In fact, overall, um, diesel electric is 7% more energy efficient than a 100% electric locomotive. Yeah, so what you're saying is that the 
the, the locomotive actually runs on electricity, but the electricity is coming from a diesel um, generator on board. That's right. And so why would you um, want to <laughs> build 240 more power plants to supply trains with the electricity they need over uh, tens of thousands of miles of electric wires and substations right. when they're already electric? Well, as a logistical... Main- I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I, I just wanted to add electric mainly for passenger rail that stop and start, accelerate and go high speeds. Mm-hmm. Freight is the opposite. They, they try to never stop. Uh, if they don't have to, they very slowly accelerate and they go very low speeds to reduce the aerodynamic drag. Uh-huh. Well, w- uh, let's talk about the logistics because if you only go back 100 years in American history... We actually had a system where rail and water transport pretty much worked to move an awful lot of stuff around the United States, even when the you know, 48 states were, were all completed and we were a continental nation. We were, you know, in, in, in 1916, uh, we were moving huge quantities of stuff around. It's really a matter of sort of the end of the journey, right? The last stage of the journey. Yeah, well... I mean, trucks move almost anything going less than 500 miles um, because it's convenient. You go door to door, um, and our economy is built on just-in-time, which is one of the greatest wastes of fuel in history because these trucks are showing up half empty, just containing what's needed, and returning empty. Uh Uh-huh. And they've got... They're heading all over America. Yeah. And so they're... um, you know, they're wasting enormous amounts of fuel. They're already inefficient compared to rail and uh, ships. Uh, but we don't have any policies. I've, I, I have read hundreds and hundreds of transportation documents, and they're all planning for endless growth. How are we going to get more trucks on the road? Mm-hmm. Um, if they're paying any attention to energy at all, it's reducing greenhouse gases, not energy efficiency. So we've never focused on that. But is it feasible that we could go back to a system where we weren't using so many trucks for so many trips of that kind uh, so that we were depending more on water and rail transport? Uh, I mean, we did we did do it before. You know, we did it for the years between the Civil War and and the end of the First World War. Could we get back to that? Well, I don't know. I mean, we used to have um, four times more rail than we have now. And I don't know if the right of ways are gone. Um, have we lost and, that much? That's that's amazing. Yeah, we used to have three hundred twenty thousand miles of rail in the states. Uh, wow. But if the right of ways are gone, and you know they need one percent grades, you can't put railroads just anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could certainly try to use ships more, but we've let our marine infrastructure fall apart. The locks and levees and so on on the inland waterways are really in bad shape. Well, um, that, that's not true here. Um, I live right, n- right next to the Champlain and Erie Canals. Um, the Champlain Canal is four, four miles away, and the Erie Canal is about 20 miles away. They, they kind of diverge. The uh, Champlain goes north, the Erie goes west. But the uh, state of New York has kept them in immaculate condition. Oh, you're lucky. Mississippi um, River and Missouri and other places aren't so uh, have, have that infrastructure maintained. Um, so we, uh, in your view, we, we can't get back to that system where, you know, the, the bulk of the journey of the goods is done on rail and water and the, only the last increment is done in some kind of a truck. I, I don't think so because, uh, you know, un, until oil came along, everybody lived near the coast, everybody, you know, very few people inland and then rail allowed people to move inland, but then trucks with four million miles of roads just in the United States, you could live anywhere. Now you've got 80% of communities completely dependent on trucks for everything. They don't have a port and they don't have rail. Do you think there are parts of the United States that are going to be depopulated? Yeah, I mean, the problem, you know, is that you've got 80% of people living within 200 miles of the coast, but 80% of food calories are grown inland. And that doesn't add up uh, when you're trying to think about uh, oil reaching some low enough level that it's hard to distribute food. Yeah, um, I think the Southwest, 
you know, there's certain areas of the country that absolutely are unsustainable and will be the first ones where you see mass migrations. Mm -hmm. I wonder uh, about what you're saying about the food production in the Midwest, because uh, isn't that calculated right now on the basis of the industrial farming system that we use, of agribiz? And if we stop doing that and food has to be grown differently, um, what is that, does that change the equation? Oh, I think we've become so reliant on um, fertilizers and pesticides, which are gas and oil-based, respectively. Uh, but the worst thing we've done is let our topsoil, which is our true wealth, uh, degrade. It used to take civilizations an average of 1,500 years to uh, farm their soil so much that it washed away. Now, we've in 100 years, in Iowa, where the best topsoil exists, we've let it go from 18 inches to 9 inches, and you need 6 inches to grow food. Uh, so we're, you know, there's a lot of other limiting factors besides oil that are creeping up on us. Well, it also would seem that um, because of the limits of uh, of oil and and uh, really of petrochemicals and and uh, any kind of petroleum uh, commodities, that we're not going to be able to carry on industrial agriculture whether we like it or not. Yeah, I I agree. I, there's a it's a convergence of many many forces, but I think that um, without transportation. You don't have anything else. You can't even deliver the 8,000 windmill parts to the turbine factory and then move the turbine somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Transportation is the number one issue that needs to be solved. And if you don't define the problem correctly, you can't define the solutions correctly. Well, I, I, I must say I'm of the opinion that we're not going to solve this problem in the way that most people fantasize. That is solve it in a way that allows us to continue running the kind of techno-industrial society that we have. I mean, if nothing, you, you've said in your book that um, uh, the territory of the United States can probably only feasibly support a, a population of about 100 million people, and that's about a third of what we got, have now. Yeah, that's what Professor David Pimentel said at Cornell. There's other estimates, uh, estimates close to that. Um, and I also don't see how we can have an 80 to 100 uh, percent renewable electric grid. I spent a lot of time on that um, mm -hmm. in my book, as well as energy storage. Um, let's talk about those things. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about the electric grid, because, um, uh, you know, electricity is kind of the foundational element of civilization. And, of course, we take it for granted. There are very few people who walk into a room and reach for the light, light switch and are surprised when the lights come on, right? Yeah. So that's, that's our baseline normal. Um, but uh, the challenges of keeping the grid going are really pretty, pretty stiff and, and difficult. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, <laughs> you've got two-thirds of it powered by fossil fuels and 20% by nuclear. And yet the nuclear plants are almost all at the end of their lifespans. Uh, half of them um, are likely to close because the post-Fukushima retrofits are too expensive. Uh, they're unreliable. Uh, they're, they're, there's, uh, you know, and new ones aren't getting built because you can build a natural gas plant for a quarter of the cost in a tenth of the time. There's no way to raise capital to build new ones, and nor can you build them in most in many states because there's no nuclear waste storage. So nuclear is not going to be powering us. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's not going to be natural gas, because as we discussed, it's finite. Uh, it's not going to be um, coal, because that too is finite. Um, it's not going to be hydropower, because there's nowhere left to put dams to, you know, that would provide much more power. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be geothermal, because that's built out, and the remaining sites are way too small or too far from the grid. Uh, it's not going to be biomass, as we just discussed. Um, it's not going to be hydrogen fusion, breeder fission, wave, tidal, ocean current, or methane hydrates because these are far from being commercial. So that means wind and gas must save the day. It's all up to them to do that. And um, the problem with that is they just add to the blaze. They do not replace 
fossil fuel and nuclear plants. Excuse they, me, but did you did you say wind and gas? Did you did you mean wind and solar? I meant wind and solar. I'm sorry. Okay. I meant wind and solar, um, and they need to be balanced by natural gas or energy storage because mm-hmm. coal and nuclear can't ramp up and down. It takes them hours. Mm-hmm. So you just can't um, start and stop the uh, power plant uh, on a dime. No, you can't. There's only a, and hydro can help, but a lot of times there's a drought or agriculture needs it. Um, there's only a few ways to try to balance uh, the wind and solar power, um, and then wind and solar power is far more seasonal than people realize. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if you had a national grid, which isn't likely, but I don't want to go into that. Um, there wouldn't be enough solar power in the winter for the Southwest to share with everyone. Um, and the same with wind. In the summer, the, U- the U.S. is practically a wind desert everywhere. Uh-huh. And the Southeast is always a wind desert. It just doesn't get much wind. It doesn't have commercial-scale wind. So uh, the, the, even if you, you, you have to have energy storage if you want the grid up, um, and we're far from being able to do that. What have we got? And, well, and, and how has got, it improved over the years? Well, we don't have energy storage. We have pumped hydropower, which uses more energy than it returns. And that's where you pump water up to a reservoir above an existing hydropower dam uh, when there's low demand and then release it when there's high demand. Uh, we only have, I don't know, something like 43 of them. Um, but we'd need 7,800 more to provide just one day of U.S. energy storage. And there have only been two built since 1995 because there's nowhere left to put them. Mm-hmm. We only have one compressed air energy storage plant in the United States, and those can only go in salt domes, which are nearly all in just three states along the Gulf. Um, and we'd need uh, almost 4,000 more of them. What is a salt dome? Tell the listeners. Well, a salt dome is a kind of, um, it's a geology where you have uh, these walls of salt which heal if a hole were to get into it, it seals it over. Um, They're deep under the earth so that the air doesn't leak out when you pump it in, and you can pump it in over and over. Um, We don't have any in aquifers, abandoned rock mines, and other underground caverns because it's very unlikely that the air would be trapped down there. It would find a way to leak out. Mm-hmm. But you can't just put those anywhere, and we only have one, and they're very expensive. Uh, the other possibility is concentrated solar power with thermal storage. Those can only be built in the southwest because there can be no humidity. It has to be extremely dry mm-hmm. and no pollution. And that's why two-thirds of the ones we have are in California and a quarter in Arizona. Um, and they cost almost as much as nuclear power plants, which is another reason that they only generate uh, less than six one hundredths of our energy supply now. And if we um, were to do that big time in the future, like people have fantasies about, you know, putting mirrors all over the Sonora Desert, um, you'd still have to, you'd have to, the, the electricity you produce would have to make a very long journey to the places where it's needed. Right, and we don't have the transmission lines, and states don't like them to cross. There are state lines. They want to keep whatever power they have within the state. And you'd need, um, you know, well over 8,000 more of these billion dollar per plant each. Uh, and they, a lot of our uh, solar farms, uh, concentrated solar power, are only mirrors. They're not storing any electricity mm-hmm. at all. They're um, just heating it, heating the, uh, some element that is uh, making it, what, a turbine turnaround or something? Yeah, so they and photo, um, solar photovoltaic without storage are providing massive amounts of power at noon which, when it's not needed. Mm-hmm. It's the peak periods when people get up in the morning and go to work and return from work that you need power. So solar without energy storage is pretty worthless mm-hmm. um, in terms of doing much of anything. So that means uh, that you have to hope for a utility-scale electrochemical batteries to um, solve energy storage. None of them are commercial now, and only a few might be within 10 years. Uh, One of them is advanced lead acid, but that takes five times longer to recharge, 
as discharge, so that's not in the running. Lithium ion would deplete all known resources. I'm not, I didn't say reserves, I said resources of lithium. Um, and they're also limited by how many times they can charge and discharge. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sodium sulfur is one of the few that literally has enough material elements on Earth to actually be built. And one day of energy storage would require a 923-square-mile sodium sulfur battery. Hmm. Well, that ain't going to happen. No, and it's like $41 trillion and weighs uh, 450 million tons. <laughs> it would make the earth wobble. Yeah, well, and lithium ion and lead acid aren't uh, any better than that in terms of square miles cost uh-huh. and tonnage hardly. So, you know, that's just uh, just not going to happen. Well, the picture that you're painting is uh, one that sort of tells me that um, techno-industrial civilization has its limits, too. And, and we may be not that far away from the ultimate limit of it. Right, exactly. Um, it, and it may be, I mean, I, I'm pretty much uh, making the point that we're probably going back to the age of wood, and we ought to be preparing for that. Um, and, you know, if some miracle happens, meanwhile, we'll all party, but uh, a prudent, rational person, uh, based on the evidence, would be preparing to uh, go back to the past. Well, um, that's the reason that I wrote my World Made by Hand novels. Um, a lot of people don't believe that that's where we're heading. I uh, have been reading up on, on Japan a lot this year, especially Mars. Berman's wonderful book, Neurotic Beauty. It seems to me that Japan is probably a good candidate for the first advanced society to go medieval. Uh, oh, interesting. They've had a very unusual historical experience, and, and um, probably, you know, their, their most successful era was that era between about 1600 and 1850, when, um, I guess it's called the Edo period, when Tokyo grew to be a fairly large city, but one that was managed uh, exquisitely ecologically. You know, they, they had tremendous systems for getting water to all the neighborhoods and for removing all the wastes, and they didn't use fossil fuels, and, you know, they developed a, uh, a very high culture of uh, tremendous artistry, and um, they had a pretty good system going until Commodore Perry landed in Tokyo Bay. I think the journey back in America would, would probably be pretty rough. What's your, what, what does your imagination tell you about how we're going to get back to that, to that uh, earlier level, or let's say a reset of uh, the human project? Well, I, I just I don't see how it can uh, go well, because we're the most dependent of any society on Earth on, on oil. Um, I don't know. I, I might, if one thing we could do... Um, Isaac Asimov in 1974 uh, said the only thing that we could do is to try to keep our birth rate down, uh, which means giving women interesting things to do, running the government, science, industry. Um, a, and he, he, he said that would be kind of a woman's lib world. <laughs> uh, so either we lower population or uh, humanely or we just let Mother Nature do it. Uh, and he said... And I have a suspicion that we won't make the right choice, which is the tragedy of humanity right now. I've been shrewd enough to be born in 1920, which means I'll be safely dead before the crunch comes. That's not you. That's Asimov. That's Asimov. But you guys will see for yourself. I hope you see a world in which mankind has decided to be sane. But I must say in all honesty that I figure that the chances against are against it. So that was his take on what to do and what lay ahead. Well, I'm, I'm back gonna, in 1974. I'm going to kind of force the issue with you because I asked you what was going on in your imagination. What does your imagination tell you about that journey back? And and uh, you didn't quite lay it out. I I think it's well. I I read a lot about fallen societies um, elsewhere, uh, North Korea, uh, war torn societies in, in Africa. I don't think it's any different than that. I think you're going to see, um, you know, you're only nine meals away from a revolution, a uh, famous saying. So mm-hmm. you're going to see um, 
more, I think that the politics now is a sign of what's to come, where you have Trump running and um, increasing hatred and racism and uh, people uh, forming coalitions of their own little groups, whatever those turn out to be. And I, that's something that fascinates me, but I don't know how the groupings will happen. I don't know how much the government at, at local, state, or federal levels will try to restrict people from migrating and um, mm-hmm. leave some areas that are the worst as is so they don't topple the lifeboats of other areas. Like, will they prevent people in Arizona from coming to the Central Valley? Or, or I, I don't, I, that, it, that intrigues me, and I'm sure that Homeland Security has some idea of what the plans are, but that's being kept uh, classified information from the public. Yeah, I think when people get away from home, um, it, it gets a lot harder to survive. You know, you get rained on two or three times and, and you get pretty sick. You know, I hear a lot of fantasies around here in upstate New York. People are afraid that, uh, you know, if the economy really went south in the big way, you know, if, we, if there was an EMP attack or something, an electromagnetic pulse attack on our um, electric grid, for example, that the, uh, the hordes of uh, uh, looting New Yorkers would come up here 200 miles to, to upstate New York and... I, I actually don't think they, you know, that 99.9% of them would even make it. Yeah, I, but I mean, the young people can get pretty far on a bicycle. Or I, I, I think it'll, I agree with you that a lot of people will just remain where they are, hoping things will get better. There, a pandemic is, is possible, too. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in the 1918 flu, only 2% of Americans died. I know that sounds like a lot, but they think half of people in India or other countries where uh, malnutrition... Uh, and hunger rain uh, makes you more vulnerable to disease. So mm-hmm. I think that could also play a role in population decline here. Uh, it frustrates me because one of the reasons I've written about all this is to try to get friends, family, enlightened people to steer their children away from becoming lawyers and uh, more towards um, farming or agriculture or you know professions that will be meaningful in the future. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I've changed very many people's lives. It's just too hard to contemplate a different future or imagine it. Well, you know, we, we speak about all of these rescue remedies for our energy problem. And, you know, at the, as they say, at the end of the day, it all kind of ends up seeming like an exercise in futility. You know, we're, we're not going to get to that alt energy nirvana that we're wishing for. You know, we really have to make other arrangements. No, we ought to be building passive solar homes out of empty beer cans. And, <laughs> and you know, all the, there's so many things we could do with the energy we have left, and we're just spending it in one last party. Yeah. Driving to Walmart and, uh, and vacationing in Orlando. Yeah, I think our, our descendants will be furious that we spent our oil driving al- around alone in 4,000 pound cars uh, and just you know blew the fuel out with, without thinking of the future yeah well Alice um, do, do we have any uh, is there, can we shed any uh, light and cheer on the situation as we sign off I think it's important for people to understand our situation because then you appreciate what you have and that's made me uh, much more satisfied with my life and uh not just taking it for granted, being grateful. I think that being grateful is very important, and I agree with you. And um, I'm awful glad that you came by uh, the podcast to talk to me about these things. Well, likewise, it was fun for me, too. Good luck there in California. California's kind of a spooky place these days, isn't it? It's the shake and bake state. I'll be uh, front row for whatever transpires. Yeah. Well, uh, I hope it's uh, not that interesting, and uh, we will ride again. So thanks for coming on the show. Thank you.